Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This podcast series is proudly brought to you by Russell Investments. With more than 80 years of experience, Russell Investments is a global investment solution partner dedicated to helping investors reach their long-term goals. Russell Investments specialize in multi-asset solutions that combine asset allocation, capital markets insights, actor exposure, manager research, and portfolio implementation. Welcome back to the XY Advisor Podcast. I'm Fraser Jack, and today we are wrapping up our five-part series on impact, or sorry, ESG, with a bit of an overlay of impact investing. Uh, Welcome back to the podcast, Philip Moffat. Hi, Fraser. Thank you for joining us today. We're talking about the uh, the concept of supply and demand, and and in particular, uh, where do we find all these companies? Um, You know, I, I sort of think of the ASX 200 as a fairly small on to fishing when it comes to companies that are you know a, a, a deep or deeper into the green. So let's let's talk about uh, where do we find and how do we how do we go with the su- supply and demand equ- equation when it comes to finding ESG companies. Yeah, it's a great question because yeah, as we've discussed in the previous episodes, the whole idea is really still in, it, in its infancy, and um, the way historically these kind of topics have been addressed is through exclusions. So you just say, I'm just not going to invest in armaments or alcohol or whatever it happens to be. Whereas now the idea of ESG uh, addresses first thing, the subtleties that are at work across the entire universe of assets. And secondly, the benefits that some of those subtleties can bring non-financial outputs of businesses can bring to valuation sustainability as well as the, the negatives. And because there's no agreed st- set of standards, what you tend to find is if somebody brings an ESG or sustainable product to an, an advisor, it very often will be constructed around a set of uh, exclusions. So just say, I'm not going to do all these things, therefore it qualifies as being ethical or ESG or whatever you know brand label you want to put on it. And, and we're on a journey to go further than that. But until the metrics improve and are more universally accepted, it's going to be really hard to verify uh, as you go. So I think it's a, it's a matter of, again, as we said in the previous episodes, the advisor not really understanding the preferences of the client and then also having to spend some time with the provider of the asset service um, to really understand what they mean by ESG and impact. So if I'm thinking of this um if somebody comes to me with a conversation around just exclusions, is it does that sort of say that they're only working in a space where you know they haven't now moved into that I- exclusions plus influence or or that yeah. balance between the two? Yeah, yeah. So, so the real power for the investors, particularly investors who are who are working in in groups. So, you know, you've you've got somebody who's managing a, a large enough pool of capital that can have an influence. Is that instead of just saying I'm not going to invest in your business because it doesn't meet you know, whatever criteria I've set is I'm actually going to invest in your business and I'm not going to sell out because I'm going to work with you to take you on a journey to improvement. And this is the big question. Let's let's think about a great example is for the super funds post um, Rio and Duke and George, Gorge. Do you sell all your Rio shares? And if you sell all your Rio shares and you're a big holder, you don't have a voice at the table. Or do you retain them? and use your voice at the table to be an activist. And so there's a big conversation and debate about that uh, amongst big pools of capital, and I'm pretty confident that's going to emerge its way down into um, more fractured groups of capital and and, and to the advisor network where you'll be wanting to work with either uh, investors who use their voice to try and improve the outcomes that matter to you and those who just say, I'm not going to get involved in that. And increasingly, managers will be evaluated on their ability to create change as well as financial return. Yeah. And so when they do that, when those big groups do that, they can basically go to the table and say, if you, if you don't do this, this and this, then we're out. Is yeah, that that- basically. Um, and of course, it's not just if you think as, as an investor in the marketplace, now if, if Philip Moffat or Fraser Jack is an individual investor, if I see all the big pools of capital going to an organisation saying, unless you improve these five things, uh, we might withdraw our capital, I might sell that stock before they sell the stock. 
right? So, uh, or if I think they're going to have an impact, I might buy, buy more of the stock because I think they're going to. So it'll have an echo right through the marketplace as these bigger, more influential pools um, roll their sleeves up and actually go to work. Yeah, okay, interesting. Now, t- now, talk to me about the astro- size of the Australian market in this space. And, and you mentioned sort of in some earlier um, messaging that we were a little bit behind with some of the stuff, mm. but I also feel like we're a little bit in front too when it comes to some of the you know social impact we've obviously had. Our, the governance around our businesses has been yeah. um, probably yeah, a bit yeah, higher yeah. Over, over years. So we, we, I feel like we were a little bit ahead in some spaces and as well as behind. Where, where do we sit for um, other global managers looking at Australian market? Uh, I think I think in previous episodes I've referred to Europe a few times. You know, Europe is uh, much further evolved, particularly uh, Northern Europe, much further evolved in terms of thinking about ESG and sustainability issues and the way they invest. But uh, Australia has a has a strong history in the space as well. Um, I would say that some of the the larger pools of capital that have been put together here, in particular, the kind of the industry. Super funds who've, who've thought about their members' interests and their members tend to be concentrated in different sorts of industries and so on. So they've managed to prioritise those members' interests in a in a more concentrated way. This is what matters to to our members, and they can use that to help influence the investments they make themselves. So that's evidenced in 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 what they do. So I think about Aware, for instance, who generate very strong financial returns, but out of affordable housing. And affordable housing is important for our members who are teachers and nurses and healthcare workers and those sorts of people. So it works that way. It also works to the extent that we have a range of uh, really high quality ESG ethical impact strategies emerging in Australia. And we also have a bunch of managers who've been using those sorts of approaches, even though they've not kind of labelled themselves that way, emerging in the space. So, um, you know, I, I'm very optimistic, particularly as – the younger generation of people mature and they have more assets to invest and they start to demand more than just financial return, that we're on an inevitable path towards um, ESG sustainable impact as, as a core thematic. Yep. And you mentioned Europe a few times of being, you know, the, the leaders yeah. in this space. Why is that? Oh, I think a recognition of ageing population, a recognition of uh, of uh, social welfare state and the costs of environmental and social degradation directly hitting the national balance sheet. So if you if you like if you think about Scandies for instance or, or or Northern Europe, where the government's on the hook for healthcare and uh, education and employment outcomes and so on, the direct costs of poor ESG are felt by the public purse, and so it makes a lot of sense for that to be prioritised as a preference to places elsewhere in the world where you don't necessarily have that social cost burden. And profit maximisation, financial profit maximisation, doesn't cost it come as so much of a of a, of a measurable social cost. Yep. Um, with regard to the size of the you know the global pool of investments, uh, when we put the an ESG overlay and we're going for say a medium green, you know whatever it might be, then uh, then how how much does that reduce the size of the pool? Oh, I don't know, Fraser. To be honest, probably I should know that, but it's going to be substantial to to to, to be investing in in pools that you really believe have a commitment to measuring and monitoring and governance and to be able to reporting uh, at some level around those things, you know, i got to think it, it reduces the global pool by 80% or something. But amongst very big global institutional investors, that gate is already quite high so that that 80% that's being excluded is already excluded and not getting much of a look in. Yep. Uh, does it does that mean that um, the other the, the diversification across other sectors is um, becomes less important if we if we're focusing more on ESG? No, that's actually a really good question I, I, because I think um, some sectors lend themselves to uh, ESG measurement and verification better than others, and so it is possible that you get a bias towards those sectors in portfolios that are dedicated. ESG. And, and so from a portfolio construction perspective, like a total portfolio approach, you don't want, certainly want to be mindful that you don't end up with, uh, let's say you employ three global ESG equity managers and you find that they're, they're sort of all super mega overweight um, alternative energy and nothing else. And what you end up with is an alternative energy fund. Um, you want to be you know very cognizant of that um, going forward. But I, I do think that you know, this is just a view. It's not, I can't verify it, um, that as 
investors and investees come to realise that that those metrics matter, that they'll proliferate across all sectors. It'll become yep. ubiquitous. Yep. And what do you think advisors should be looking for when it comes to the investment philosophies of the fund managers? Oh, I'd, I personally, I'd still be looking for an investment manager who's talking first and foremost about financial return and diversification benefits within a portfolio. So, you know, what are you looking for? You're looking for an asset that's going to give you really strong returns and that's going to reduce the risk too much to the extent that you can by diversifying in your portfolio. So they're the two major drivers. If somebody comes in and they're, they're pitching ESG or impact first and return second, I would be sceptical, not because I don't believe in those things, but I just don't think that it's long-term sustainable to build a business around something that's not going to generate competitive financial returns. If the, if, if the assets don't generate competitive financial returns, the strategies won't survive. So it's it's incumbent upon us as managers to, to, to communicate clearly that we think those two things go hand in hand. And if you're not communicating that clearly, I'd be sceptical of the offering. So it's a real balancing act, isn't it? The sustainability yeah. of the, the client's portfolio as well as the sustainability of the, the underlying investments and the sustainability of the advice practice. It's all sort of Absolutely. It's a balancing but, act. But yeah. at the end of the day, you, you know, it sounds crude, but you, you've got to make returns for your clients. Yep. Um, otherwise, the businesses won't flourish. Yep. Fantastic. Philip Muffet, thank you for joining us in this series. If somebody wants to, uh, quick, just quickly, if they wanted to get hold of you, what's the best way to uh, continue the conversation with you? Oh, you can find me on LinkedIn or Beckon Capital website um, or just type, you know, Philip Moffat into the Google later and uh, I'll pop up. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I love this stuff and, and I'm passionate about it and I'd love to engage with anyone who wants to have a conversation. So, you know, don't hesitate. I'm on LinkedIn as well. Brilliant. Natural. Brilliant. Thank you, Philip. Really appreciate your time uh, and energy in putting into this series. Thank you so much. Okay. See you, Fraser. Thanks. Welcome back to this final episode, Elizabeth. Uh, Fraser, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming along the journey with us over the last uh, five episodes. Uh, really appreciate your input. Okay. My pleasure. In this uh, in this episode, I really want to lean into the concept of supply and demand, and and, and thinking about where can you know advisors and fund managers for that sake find these um, these ethical investments and um, uh, especially around the idea the concept that the ASX 200 is quite a small pond to fish in I guess you could say do you think that uh, we need to look globally for these types of businesses or is that, can we find them within Australia I think fish um, there are some companies in Australia that are trying to do the right thing if you're talking about individual companies and not funds um, but I think that we're way behind the rest of the world that have already decided that um, ESG is the new normal and that there's no question about that. Uh, I, possibly because the uh, policy of different governments in other parts of the world um, are clearer than ours about how we're going to tackle all of these issues, but because they seem to be more forward-thinking in terms of investing to address the issues of um, climate change and um, climate degradation generally, which is uh, what they're looking to do with um, renewable energy type assets and to possibly even reverse some of the effects of climate change. Yeah, interesting. So you think uh, obviously the, the governance side of this is around you know what's required by Australian law. So you think extreme companies are fall behind in that way because the, the government hasn't been as progressive? I think, that, I think that the government sets policy and then companies respond to the policy in different sorts of ways um, and say that they're taking things into account. I think that um, ASIC is um, looking more and more towards making companies accountable for what they're doing. Um, but I think that um, ASIC hasn't actually been um, as diligent as they could be in terms of pursuing super funds in particular about what they're doing, although they're starting to now. Yeah. Um, and governance is not just about what it is that companies are doing, but governance is also about how companies can address the wrongs that have happened as a result of previous policy and what they're going to do about it. Yep. And I think that the S part of the SNG in relation to the societal impacts of what companies are doing is becoming more and more important. 
and it's difficult to put a dollar value on that but it, it's right up there in terms of people's feelings and emotions about right and wrong. Yep. Yeah, that's certainly a very big one, isn't it? The idea of mm -hmm. things like human rights or the mm -hmm. social impact of that product's play in, in society. Yep. And what you're talking about in terms of impact is also important because um, there are some funds that are out there that are impact funds. So that what they're actually doing is to put, money into a particular um, exercise or a philanthropic type of offering that will go on to fund, address mental health issues or inequality in terms of housing or funding medical research. And so that's another bucket of assets that people can invest in that make returns for them. But also that they have a feel-good factor that, you know, we're actually contributing to medical technology or whatever. It's not quite answering your question, but it's out there in terms of yep. the sorts of assets that one can invest in. Yep. Yep. Now, uh, should we be worried about diversification across different um, markets and sectors then if yes. we're focusing solely or not? Well, firstly, I guess, on, on ESG types of investing, is, is, is the, does the diversification come in later or...? Or no, is needed? Think, no, diversification comes in first um, um, because um, different asset classes, because of their nature, will sort of go up and down in terms of value um, or and price and diversification is there to adjust the ups and downs of what's happening in particular asset classes and how much um, of a risk clients are prepared to take with their funds. Um, but within each asset class, there is an ESG type factor that can be um, applied. Uh, I know that the real estate sector, for example, is looking to put ESG and, and looking at, govern at, looking at um, the green and environmental impact of what they do is a really big thing in terms of uh, promoting the type of um, investments that they have. Fantastic. And uh, uh, look, it just seems like that's it's a forever changing and moving environment. How do advisors mm -hmm. stay on top of, of all of this? I think that um, advisors are sort of getting pretty much swept up in the we have to find something for clients. Um, and I think it's also important to step back and to figure out what you know or what's reasonable with a fair amount of certainty. Um, and to be critical at all times. What, um, what are you looking for when it comes to, you know, the philosophies or the investment philosophies behind some of the funds? What, what do you look for? I'd like to see that they have one yep. to start with um, yep. and how it actually applies and um, what they're doing in terms of um, approaching, say, the companies within their um, fund about what they're doing and how active they are and how they're reporting on things and what progress they're making, if any. Do you see a lot of the uh, – the so just going back to the um, concept of Australian companies versus global companies, do you see a lot of the current funds sort of stacking themselves with that global um, company situation or are they still – Well, yeah. I think I, – look, I think that uh, investing in what's happening locally is nice because you think you, think you know what they're doing, um, but – don't really. I mean, companies are as open as they, as they choose to be, but Australia is really a very small fish in the world in the in the world of money. And I think that we're sort of between one and three percent of what's happening in the rest of the world. And not to have any exposure to what's happening in the rest of the world means that um, you're missing out on opportunities to invest in. Um, companies that actually are making a difference and are, are, are trying to make a difference uh, in a bigger way than what's possible in Australia because of our population size. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you, Elizabeth Hatton, for coming on the series. I really appreciate you being part of it. Uh, if somebody wanted to reach out to you and have a continued conversation, what's probably the best way for them to, to get hold um, of you? Yeah, they can look at our website, uh, vivafp.com au and there's a, a conversation box and you can drop me a question or email us and um, vivafp.com.au and um, be happy to take your call.
or Fantas- email. Fantastic. Uh, really appreciate your time and uh, energy into the series. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the time. Paul Garner, thanks for joining us in this final episode of the series where we're talking about supply and demand uh, for around ESG. Yeah, uh, gee, hasn't it? Both areas, we've had a great increase in the last few years. It's yep. been wonderful and, and certainly made our job easier and and also given the, uh, the investor uh, a lot more choice because in the past we had found it really difficult to find ESG options in in the fixed interest area, in the cash area. Um, it, it's still difficult in cash, uh, but fixed interest has been a, a, a major increase in that area. Property is still um, a specific area that, that needs more supply, I guess. And also what it means as, a, as, a, as an investor, uh, the Australian market is, is, is much more immature than the global market, particularly in the areas of renewables and uh, making industries more efficient. You, you have to go global. So often uh, uh, an ethically filtered portfolio will be more uh, tilted towards international exposure because there's just more mature companies in this area that either people want to support or or, or avoid and you, ha- you have to go uh, it's just the nature of the australian market it's ma- made up of miners and 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 large banks so it, to develop an australian portfolio you have to go down to more uh, medium sized smaller companies which inherently increases the risk and may not uh, suit where people are at in terms of the theme of their portfolio. So you have to go into you have to go international, and you've got to yeah, find. It's that. really it's interesting, isn't it? You mentioned immature. So um, just just by the nature of, of of the services that we've been strong in, how do you see us moving? Are we are we, are we moving quickly towards it, though? Well, you know, quickly um, in terms of uh, quickly is variable depending on. Uh, how long it takes for a company to be investable in, in, in a broad sense, um, in, in, a, in a more regulated sense. So there's many startups and smaller companies that you can invest in, but uh, we've also got to be so cognizant of the risk um, involved in that. And, and so what we're seeing uh, a greater demand on and, and a greater supply of is impact investing where People, I, I guess, with the more sophisticated investor or those with larger amounts of money, which whose uh, f- philanthropy is is more of an issue, uh, but they also want to see an investment return, is having investments in things that will make an impact in terms of uh, obvious areas, our social housing, uh, where housing is made available for a greater percentage of the population, but it's also uh, a viable investment return. Uh, green bonds, it, it, the general area of impact investing in terms of making a real positive contribution and but also seeing an investment return is probably the biggest growth area. Now, at the moment, that's more of a niche because there typically aren't a listed uh, opportunity. It's, it's more of an unlisted and hence riskier, less regulated area that's more open to the sophisticated investor or, or those with larger amounts of money that, that can then spread that across different areas. So that I, I see more yep. growth in that area coming forward. Yeah, probably, probably a little bit more difficult for advisors to get too involved in that, isn't it? Because I think this, this certainly needs to be an amount of individual investigation from the from the actual investor. Indeed, indeed. less research available about that, less track record. Uh, but uh, I know uh, some of my colleagues who are, who are more, much more advanced than I uh, are, are, are much heavily involved in that area as well. Uh, fantastic. Now, um, you mentioned Australia being an immature market. Wh- which markets do you see as more mature? Which are, which are the areas and countries where you see there's a, there's you know they're well ahead of us? Well, uh, you know the major economies: U.S., uh, uh, Germany, Northern Europe. Uh, you know those major Italy, Germany, uh, Scandinavian countries have uh, such niche, uh, not well, uh, niche in a global sense, but uh, amazing stories of of uh, companies that help to make 
not only wind farms and those sorts of things, but are heavily involved in making existing industries more efficient in terms of equipment or in terms of uh, waste uh, renewal, uh, using waste, making existing energy uh, providers more efficient in terms of the, the control systems, the, the machinery. It's, it's, it's often too, too, too many to mention, but uh, it, the individual stories can be very, um, in, uh, not, uh, oh, I think, uh, inspiring in, in what their engineering capabilities are. IT is an obvious yep. area, but then you get into social issues. Um, you know, Facebook and, you know, they're not, uh, they're not emitters, but, uh, you know, there's big concerns about their societal uh, influence and, yep. and their privacy issues, all of those sorts of things, the way they influence society. Yep. Yeah, got to love the algorithm. Mm. Tell, t- tell me about, um, tell me about uh, how you go about um, researching and finding out more information around what the fund managers are doing. Um, uh, obviously, you mentioned some of the stuff that you're doing with the co-op, but, but how do you personally go about um, researching that? Well, I, uh, p- through uh, my, uh, I work with an investment analyst who also has that uh, uh, passion. So we develop um, models based on, on our research. Uh, we also uh, have individual conversations with fund managers who uh, either appear in those models or who we're interested in. Uh, so then the main area is just going to the source and and finding that out. Uh, if we need to build yep. a, a, a customised portfolio, then I work very closely with our analyst whose full-time job is to vet uh, companies and, and sectors and what they're doing. Yep. So for advisors getting or introducing into the space that are a bit uh, sort of newer in their journey along, what what do you suggest to them when it comes to thinking about what their investment philosophies might be um, and how they can sort of start to, as you mentioned, it's not not, not a good idea just to dip your toe in the water, but uh, how do they sort of get more, you know, how do they get a start, sure. I guess? Uh, well, I joined the Responsible Investment Association of Australasia as a good start. And through that, I met individual advisors who also specialise in that area and they introduced me to the Ethical Advisors Cooperative, which um, was, uh, I guess, a more interactive because the, the Responsible Investment Association deals with fund managers, advisors and the whole industry, where the Ethical Advisors Cooperative is just financial advisors who specialise in this area. And, that, and the interaction through that and with my colleagues in that area has been of huge, huge value and and uh, accelerated my learning um, much more so than I could ever do on my own. Uh, and so that was big. Yeah, that, that was a big influence. So I, I would encourage advisors keen on this area to to get involved in those two organisations because it's, yeah, different. it's amazing, Not isn't my, it? The, I don't try and impart my values onto onto the people I talk with. It's all about them, their values, and having that reflected in their in their portfolios. Yeah, amazing. It's 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 interesting, isn't it? This this thing keeps coming through the idea of um, being active in a community of other people that are doing the same thing, and all of a sudden you sort of you learn from them, you, you learn from mm. yourself, you learn from the literature, you learn from all the all the moving parts. So that's the uh, the RIAA with the association, um, and uh, and again the um, the co op. But it's like uh, XY, well, I guess so um, you know it's thank a wonderful you. well exactly it's right. a wonderful sharing community, and uh, you know. <laughs> It's uh, I it's it's wonderful because we you, yeah essentially we're all competitors but then we all cooperate on these on these areas which is great it's it's nice to be part yeah. of that. This certainly is a nice amount of sharing across all the platforms. So, uh, Paul, thank you so much for being part of this um, of the series. Really appreciate it. If somebody wanted to continue the conversation or get hold of you, what's probably the best way for them to, to reach out? Um, it, my website novowealth.com.au. Um, uh, please share my email and um, and number. Very happy to have a chat and yep. point yep. people in the right directions. Fantastic. I notice you're also on LinkedIn there, yeah, so yep. they can All find the, you there. Uh, the socials and should be there, hopefully. Fantastic. Uh, Paul, really appreciate uh, your um, coming along and, and, and sharing your wisdom with us all. Um, it's been oh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interest. Welcome back, Alexandra Brown, to this, our final uh, episode in this series. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Fraser. 
Fantastic. Now, we're talking about supply and demand. Uh, obviously, uh, we've sort of mentioned this in a few of the um, earlier episodes, but uh, let's start with the concept of, you know, finding finding the right option. We've talked about prioritising and finding the right options. And, uh, you know, when it comes to the funds, when it comes to the fact that, you know, even even in Australia here, we're a fairly small, small pond of fishing. Yeah, we are. Um, but, you know, I'm not, Fraser, I'm not actually sure of a use case that would just consider you know, only the ASX 200 or, you know, just um, as an investable universe. But there are definitely uh, ASX funds that spring to mind that I would class as ethical. There's an Australian ETF that I find particularly strong. Uh, they use really tight screening and the result is a world of, of, of great Australian funds that I would consider ethical. There's an ethical SMA. There's two big Australian funds out there. And, uh, and even an impact fund, which has more of the smaller and mid caps as well, um, that I would consider to be quite deep green. Fantastic. Uh, t- talk to us about the, um, where we are in the world. I mean, Australia is sort of, uh, I, I, I thought it was actually quite high with the governance section because we, you know, we live in a country where there's a lot of rules and regulations. Uh, but t- tell us about the, how, where Australia fits in the, in the global um, you know, world of uh, ESG. Yeah, sure. The, I mean, the global market, it's definitely not small. It's huge. Uh, there's the latest GSIA report, which is the Global Sustainable Investment Alliance. And they, it shows that just over one third, so about 36% of professionally managed assets in major markets across the globe are invested in sustainable investments. And the GSIA report, it actually aggregates the responsible investment trends across Australia and New Zealand, US, Canada, Japan and Europe. And it comes out every two years and it's come out just this month. So the results are in and uh, global sustainable investment has now reached 35.3 US trillion dollars across those five major markets, which is an increase of 15% in the past two years. So a great, a huge market. And also according to this report, in the past two years, Australia's sustainable investments assets has grown by 25%. And uh, I do have the, the, I do have reports of Australia too. So in, but unfortunately it's not quite as uh, recent as I'm hoping because the benchmark report for RIA is due out in five days. <laughs> so, so, uh, if you're listening to this and it's after the 1st of September, head to RIA, the RIA website and check out their latest benchmark report with updated 2020 figures. But for 2020, uh, 2019, uh, we currently have 37% of our total assets under management are responsible investments. Wow. So, that's fantastic. Yeah. Now, tell me about this uh, diagram we talked about a while ago that you talked, uh, the, the infographic where you talked about the human um, getting money to, you know, the, where, where it's needed. Uh, how does this, uh, you mentioned that we were two, two, two and a half trillion dollars uh, behind every year. How does, this, how does that then relate to that diagram? So uh, obviously it's growing, but, you know, there's a gap between uh, between, I guess, getting everyone involved <laughs> we yep. all need to be involved that's yep. the thing it's it can't just be a select few that are helping to finance the sustainable development goals we all need to be there yep fantastic and uh, t- tell me about uh, when it comes to choosing or finding funds in this in this global market is that obviously a lot harder no i think it's easier <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> because you know there is so much more choice and yep. uh and they can get more specialized too um there's a a, a water and waste fund out there. So, you know, it's just focusing on, on water and waste management. There's, yeah, different renewables fund that, you know, so I just think that the, 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 the range is growing. Yep. Fantastic. And talk to me about the, in this case, what a lot of the, um, was to do when we, when we talked about research, we talked about the fund managers attitude and, and their, their culture within that, um, within that fund to, to be striving and pushing, um, companies, um, how can advisors keep on top of what fund managers' attitudes in, uh, are at the moment and, and, and what they are moving forward? Yeah, uh, great question, Fraser. I think that one of the, the, the first things I would do is to subscribe to fund newsletters, uh, you know, because their, their quarterly, their monthly updates are, are so informative about where the market's going, uh, the real responsible investment's going and where their fund is going, obviously. 
um, attend their webinars, find out what's going on, ask them questions, email them directly. You know, they love the opportunity to discuss their ethical options, you know, give it to them and, fi and find out more. One of my favorite hacks actually is I've signed up to an ethical fund of funds uh, so here based in Australia. And so each um, month they give me a roundup of all of the, the funds that are in this ethical fund. So I get a roundup of uh, all these ethical funds all in one newsletter. It's great. <laughs> so it saves me so much time. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, there's like there's LinkedIn groups on ESG. Another shameless plug for Outiorum as well, the Sustainable Finance Library, because as a member, we release a monthly newsletter and it highlights all the tr latest trending ESG and ethical investing research. It also, there's also a section on, uh, you know, what to listen to, what podcasts are, are great in the, in to listen to, what events and, um, and, and things like that. Uh, become a member of RIA. Uh, so many great advisor resources with RIA. Go to the RIA conference each year. Uh, if you're already in this space, join the Ethical Advisors Co-op because, you know, we network, we share ideas, we share knowledge uh, with with advisors and in the space. So that's just my few tips on, Fantastic. And I on love how the to fact, keep on top. I love the fact that there's a lot of, you know, keeping keeping the buggers accountable um, conversations in, in, in that, especially with the co-op. Um, just uh, with, uh, with with the shameless plug for LTORM, uh and I'm probably pronouncing it wrong again. Um, tell us about how people can can find that. Where, where would they find that? Uh, just head to altiorum.org, and that is a l t i o r e m dot org. And just for reference, Altiorum is Latin for higher because our our goal is to lift the finance industry higher. Fantastic. Um, thank you for that. Uh, so I think that's a great resource to go check it out. Uh, and of course, the Ethical Investors Cult we've spoken a lot about and uh, and Ria, as you mentioned, that do a conference every year. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. If somebody wants to get hold of you or talk to you more about what they can do in the space in their own business, what's the best way they can get hold of you? They can head to my website, which is investwithethics.com. Fantastic. And uh, you're also on LinkedIn uh, if they if they uh, happen to be on LinkedIn. So I'm sure they'll be able to find you. Um, Alexandra Brown, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, uh, your almost PhD-ness uh, with us all, <laughs> if that's a word. Uh, probably not. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, putting the effort in and, and sharing everything you have today. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Fraser. It's been such a pleasure to be involved in this. James Howard, welcome back to this episode. We've been talking about the supply and demand conversation around ESG funds. Welcome. Hi, Fraser. Good to be back. Thank you. Now, uh, look, I guess the first um, the first cap off the rank is the conversation around the the size of the Australian market in, in this space. Um, obviously, you know, we've we've known for many years it's a very small piece of the global market. But when when we when we're putting the uh, the ESG overlay on it, uh, how do we go? Yeah, look, I mean, the Australian market is is dominated by um, mining companies. You know, the material sector is a is much bigger in our market than um, than globally. We're over twenty percent versus I think three percent for 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 global shares. Uh, you know, IT is a much bigger component of um, the MSCI world, for example. I think um, you know, in terms of how do we do um, and 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 pure play type of ESG investments, I think that that that's actually a challenge. Not just here, but but globally as well. Um, so I think that really pushes you down um, a, a route of needing to understand you know, the ESG characteristics of of all our companies better. Um, it's one of the reasons we use ESG scores in in our um, ESG strategies to to to, to have an overall kind of uh, assessment of how how strong a company is on on ESG, um, and, and then you know. The reality is that you know Australian shares are going to form an important part of all Australian investors because you know there's you don't have the currency risk either. Um, so just using those ESG scores and and overall characteristics is is still um, going to be really important to you know to assess you know a particular investment for um, for an advisor's client. Yeah, fantastic. And on the flip side of that question, if if an Australian company is doing very well with their ESG scores, is that going to make them attractive to uh, overseas or global um, fund managers? Yeah, look, uh, maybe I'll comment on um, 
Infogen Energy was a, a security that um, that got taken over by an overseas company um, about a year or so ago. Infogen is a you know it, it produces renewable energy. Um, it was our only kind of pure play in in that space, and annoyingly, it was taken over by Iberdrola of of Spain. So um, I think um, you know that's an example of you know a, an attractive investment um, you know being swallowed up by an overseas company. Um, but really highlights that point that you know that there's that there's not enough um, pure play kind of investments. Um, I think there was uh, another example of um, uh, an ETF, an iShares ETF that had a huge position in a uh, New Zealand listed um, energy company, um, and and then it you know that 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 became a real liquidity challenge for that company. So I think it's really important to understand that. Um, you know, pure play types of ESG investments aren't, you know, there's probably not enough to, to go around for everyone's investing. And, and that then pushes you back to understanding, you know, more broadly, you know, what, what are the ESG characteristics of the companies listed on, on our market and also globally. Yeah, it sort of brings that supply and demand conversation really back into, into effect, doesn't it, if there's not enough around? It, it does, it does, yeah, and I, and I think I mentioned uh, a Danish utility company uh, in the previous session. You know that that was a good example of just a beneficiary of huge amounts of flows into you know green or ESG products. Um, that's been a been a big theme, and it continues to be a big theme. But um, you want to make sure that um, you're not overpaying for, for securities as well. And um, you know, again, it's it's trying to find that balance between. Um, ESG and, and investing in a in a sensible manner and um, recognizing that you know as you say supply and demand that influences the prices of securities and um, you know we we don't want to end up with you know a really expensive portfolio that that that's at risk of like a major correction so trying to invest sensibly recognizing some of those supply demand kind of constraints. Yep. Yeah, exactly right. Now, um, let's talk about the concept of uh, if you're searching for ESG portfolios, how important is it to think about what sectors and, and, and multiple sectors? I mean, at the end of the day, are you just looking for the purest of, you know, that that mid-green range or do you have to really go, okay, well, we can't have that because we've already got too many tech stocks or whatever? Look, it's a great question. And, and I, I think um, I, I did a piece uh, earlier uh, earlier um, on this, um, just around the the biases in ESG strategies. Um, so um, about a year ago, many ESG funds were doing extremely well because you know the energy sector had underperformed, and um, most of those ESG strategies don't have investments in in that area. When we design products, we're, we're always looking at you know that that risk aspect of. So we we don't want um, on the whole, we're trying to design products that give. Uh, investors the outcomes that that they expect. So, it, you know, most investors can't um, accommodate like huge periods of underperformance. Um, so, trying to get that balance right in terms of you know the the kind of bets you can take um, on stocks and sectors, and 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 trying to ensure there aren't huge biases in in the design. Um, it's a real real kind of risk of some portfolios that that are. Heavy in that kind of growth space, you know that, that's that's a natural place for uh, ESG investments to end. And uh, um, but yeah, in terms of like you know staple core holdings of, you know, of investors' portfolios, that that's really kind of what we specialising, I guess. And um, you know when we're designing ESG products, we're looking for for those um, portfolios to you know to be fairly balanced, well diversified. Uh, but but also giving um, investors the the kind of ESG out- outcomes they expect as well. Yep. When thinking about the um, the active management of an ESG fund, um, are you are we looking at any additional MER type stuff for, because of the ESG, or is it sort of all pretty standard? Yeah. I, I look, I think if you you go to a, a stock picking um, manager. Almost certainly, the the cost of an ESG product is going to be higher than than the standard um, products. I think that there will be some disruption there. You know, I think you're starting to see you know ETFs and more and more ESG based ETFs um, being brought to the Australian market at pretty low fees. So, uh, I think there's for sure there's some disruption lightly in you know in the MER of ESG products um uh, and and you you would expect that they would really kind of merge towards the standard um you know 
active kind of rate. And I, I think probably this really highlights ESG is just becoming a standard and, and, and an expectation of, of investors. So, um, you know, uh, th- there shouldn't be this, this it's, it's, it's no longer kind of a, a niche area. It's a standard expectation. And, and consequently, I think you, you will just see, um, you know, the costs of those funds basically becoming the same through time. Yep. Yeah, exactly. I think we've passed through that, um, it being a, a luxury item these days. Um, to talk to me about investment philosophies and obviously as, as an investment manager, you probably obviously have your, your own uh, philosophies and, and biases around what you do and, uh, do and don't love. Talk to us about how advisors can um, sort of stay on top of the investment philosophies of, of investment managers. Yeah, I think that's it's often quite a challenging one for them to um, to really. You have to you know, get under the bonnet and really, you know, look into um, you know how managers select securities and you know, like you say, what what are their ph- philosophies? Um, uh, I, I, it's probably important to try and align client expectations or you know client requirements in terms of shade of green of, of products. Um, yeah, you know, on the whole, you know. Russell is a, a multi-manager investor for, for a lot of our active products. So we combine um, different managers' um, portfolios to, to, to get a, a well-balanced and diversified portfolio. When we do that, we're also looking at how good those managers are um, at ESG. Um, probably the most important thing um, that, that that we we look for when we look at managers is, is we're, we're looking for uh, ESG to be integrated into the investment process. Um, we don't want kind of ESG specialists separate from the the investment division. I, I think that's that's on the whole um, uh, how most firms are, are moving in that direction now. But you, you still see you know separate ESG teams that aren't really um, integrated as much as they could be um, with with the investment division. I guess for for advisors, you know, that they're, they're going to need to rely on uh, some of the investments of some of the you know the rating houses like Lonsec and and Zenith etc to you know to, to make those assessments for them. But um, you know I'd, I'd encourage them to to look under the bonnet as much as they can. And I think I mentioned on the previous session the RIA website, the Responsible Investment Association of Australasia, having the certification from RIA is is really a you know a really important step in the right direction. If if ESG particularly is is what um, their clients are looking for. Yeah, fantastic, uh, James. I think that's a fairly common theme um, that's that's made its way out throughout the whole series. That uh, there is a little bit of uh, rolling your sleeves up and, and, like you said, getting under the bonnet and, and asking the right questions to uh, of of the providers, asking the right questions, you know, of your clients, um, and really just um, you know leaning in towards this, uh, not, not just taking it on face value. Um, James, thanks so much for coming on the podcast and talking or the whole series uh, and talking about this. What's the best way that advisors can, you know, if they want to roll their sleeves up and get under the bonnet, what's the best way they can find out about um, Russell? Uh, look, I think first things would be to, you know, go to the Russell Investments website and, um, you know, look at, a, look at the material that we have on the ETFs. Um, similarly, going to, you know, any of their uh, advisor contacts, uh, at Russell, um, you know, they, they can certainly put you in touch with the, you know, the, the subject matter experts um, for, for some more details on, on our products. And yeah, it would be great to hear from from some of the listeners and uh, speak directly to them because you know, that's really, you know, the exciting part of um, designing products. It's, it's kind of meeting with the end, end investor. Fantastic. Thank you, James. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, Fraser. I've really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm.